Great, please sit down. And a warm welcome to Lansdowne this morning. Well, Lansdowne, we have a motto for 2015. If you weren't here last Sunday morning, then you need to know that. It's a significant, game-changing year for us when we become one church in multiple locations and we embark together on an 18-month adventure wandering around the conurbation of Bournemouth and Christchurch and Poole. And our, our word for 2015, our motto, see, I have given you this land. That was uh, God's word through Moses to the children of Israel as he's urging them to move on from Mount Sinai and take possession of the promised land. And what was God's word to Israel through Moses is God's word for us today in 2015. But not only do we have a motto, we also have a motto card with a lovely picture on it. That's what God has given us as a church, including, if you look very closely, that giant helium balloon. It's there. That would be a great venue, don't you think, for an open-air service? Wouldn't that be wonderful? We've done baptism on the beach. Let's do singing in the sky. If you haven't picked up your motto card because you weren't here last week, we'll do that this morning. We've got lots of these still available, and I'd love you to take one away. And I'd love you to put it somewhere in your home where every day you'll see it and every day you'll pray it into your heart and into your mind. Because that verse is going to define us as a church, who we are as a community over the next few years. Because it isn't just an upbeat motto for a new year. This is the future that we are looking at. That's what God gave Moses and is giving us, a vision of the future. There are many definitions of vision. Here's one from Bill Hybels I particularly like. Vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. A picture of the future that produces passion. And I hope that's what that picture does for you. It produces passion. As you look at a picture of the future, William Tyndale, the 14th century translator of the Bible into English, he had a picture of the future. It was of every plowboy able to read the scriptures in English. Henry Ford's picture of the future was a Model T car parked in the driveway of every baker and butcher and candlestick maker. For Dr. Martin Luther King, it was the picture of a future where two children, one black and one white, would sit across from each other on a seesaw, oblivious of the color of each other's skin. For each of those people, their picture of the future made their hearts beat fast and their minds race. Now, whatever picture does that for you, that's your vision. Is it a picture of a homeless person finding shelter? A picture of a, an abused woman finding a safe place? Is it a picture of hungry children being fed? Or persecuted Christians being protected? So what's our picture of the future as a church? Well, we are a community on the move to a destiny which God has promised us. That's the corporate vision of Lansdowne. We are a people on a journey with God, just like Israel in the wilderness. So we're gonna follow uh, their journey this term as Deuteronomy records it. The book of Deuteronomy itself is like a selection of postcards that Moses writes for the benefit of all the tribes of Israel gathered just across uh, the River Jordan before they enter the Promised Land. And in these postcards, he's retelling the story to them. The story of a journey of 100 miles, which should have taken a fortnight, but in fact took 40 years. We'll find out why this morning. But before that, at verse 9, where Lorraine began the reading, we hear Moses reminding the massed ranks 
of how he faced a huge personal challenge at the start of their big move. There it is, verse 9. At that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. Here's the first then of three principles this morning. Number one, to be on this journey as a community, we need firstly leaders who reproduce. Leaders who reproduce. Now, Sean and I, we've only had two children, but when they were small, getting Emma and Laura ready for church on a Sunday morning was an operation that often required military precision. Some of you will know that my sister Beverly had, and Keith, they've had five children. My sister-in-law has had six children. I think they deserve a medal for bringing kids up to church every Sunday morning in that kind of number. My sister-in-law's children are now each producing their own children at an alarming rate. I think the 14th or 15th was born last Tuesday. Now, of course, we've got Kim and uh, Mark with their little one, James, Paul, and, and the Smiths' grandparents for the first time with Chloe. But that is nothing compared to Moses. Depending upon how you calculate the numbers, Moses, we reckon, had a million or more people to look after. So if you think getting your young family ready for church on a Sunday morning is a challenge, then consider the complexities of leading a crowd that size for about 40 years across a desert, constantly on the move. I mean, think about the arguments as to where to pitch the tents, who has grazing rights, and whose turn it is to dig the toilets. It didn't take long for Moses to realize that he needed help. And according to Exodus chapter 18, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, advises him what to do. Now, these obviously were growing pains. Not that Moses complained about that growth, for he knew that God was keeping his promise. Listen to him in verse 10. The Lord your God has increased your numbers so that today you are as many as the stars in the sky. In fact, in the next verse, Moses prays for even more growth. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he's promised. God wants to see expansion and blessing. More people knowing his truth and enjoying his life. And that should be the spirit of Lansdowne in our growing pains praying for more people to attend Alpha this term, passionate about the involvement of more people in prayer and discipleship groups, wanting to see more people called to serve the mission of the church globally, excited about our involvement in the community, thrilled that Stroudon Park Chapel have joined our growing family. God had wanted a nation to bring blessing to the world. That's why he established his relationship with Israel in the first place. And it was called the covenant. And that covenant is still in place today. But its nature has changed and its scope has widened. For now it includes all who trust in Jesus the Messiah, both Jew and Gentile, and God's growth plan now is centered not just around one ethnic group who live on a strip of land along the Mediterranean coast. No, this is an international, multicultural community driven by a vision of a land where one day people from every language and tribe and nation will worship him. That's God's picture of the future. That's his agenda growth and blessing and expansion. But growth brings change, and change is messy. And Moses in particular was suffering in all of that. So at this critical point, he knew that if he didn't respond, the community would be in danger. They had to manage their growth. And Moses couldn't do that on his own. He needed help from others. I once saw a, uh, a rather large inspirational poster in an office. It said this, teamwork means never 
having to take all the blame yourself. Moses isn't looking for other people to blame here. He wants other people to develop and for the community to be healthy as a result. So he deploys one of the great laws of leadership, the law of reproduction. Verse 13, choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. He builds teams, in other words. He delegates responsibilities. He organizes the appointment of other leaders. They create smaller sized units which can provide care where it's available immediately. Structures and people better suited to a mobile community which is rapidly changing. Now for that to work, Moses has to empower others and reproduce leaders who can impact the lives of people that he himself might never meet. Let me press the pause button here and talk a little bit, therefore, about the importance of leadership in our culture today. The primary function of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. You see, you can grow by addition, and if you grow by addition, you will recruit more followers. But if you want to grow by multiplication, then you need to add more leaders. You get people involved. You give them opportunities to serve. And friends, that's our task as a church at every level this next 18 months or so, from the toddler creche to time out. We need to be talent spotting, recruiting, giving and sharing responsibility. If we want to manage our growth in a healthy way, then we've got to commit to leadership development. You see, we're not going to deliver this exciting, expanding vision over the next few years unless we do. Look out for this logo, HHH, stands for head heart and hands, you'll be seeing and hearing a lot, of a lot about this in the next few months because from now until the summer, we're entering a season of training, increasing the active involvement of many more of us in the Lansdowne family and with God's agenda. I believe it to be one of the greatest, biggest needs in the modern church to invest in the training of leaders. And do you know who the best people are to do that? The best people to train leaders are leaders themselves. For it takes a leader to raise up a leader. Moses to Joshua, Elijah to Elisha, Paul to Timothy, Jesus to the 12 disciples. That's where it starts. When the leaders of a ministry in a local church say, let's look to invest in people for the future. Let me say this, programs don't produce leaders. Materials, books, seminars, and conferences, they won't make leaders. Leaders make leaders. People teach what they know, but they reproduce what they are. That's the law of reproduction. It begins at level one with impress. Leaders impress. But that's just the start. Level two is influence. When we, we build relationships with just a few people, we influence. Level three, the level we really need to aim for, is invest where we take on mentoring relationships that create real impact and change in individual lives. Now, that's gonna take us time. Leadership development takes time. Leaders aren't developed overnight. We can't make leaders in, in the microwave. They have to be simmered in a slow cooker. Moses spends 40 years training Joshua getting the buy-in needed, influencing up close, not at a distance. And right across LBC, 
as we set off towards the era we're calling Lansdowne without walls, we need to be generating that kind of culture. For the needs among us are huge in youth and children's work, for small group development, for pastoral care, for the practical organizing of our Sunday services. We need more musicians. We need people who are good with technology. We need those gifted in administration or welcoming. There are so many situations vacant here. Of course, we want individuals with skills and abilities and competence. But the primary requirement is character. Character. Character counts. Moses realizes that. Listen to verse 13 again. Choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes. And then verse 15, so I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men, and appointed them to have authority over you as commanders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and as tribal officials. We, we need such people in the wider society of the UK today. We need... Men and women who are wise and respected and who fear God in our local councils, influencing our education policy, involved in the media. And we urgently need such people in our churches and our homes. People with values who can navigate three of the greatest leadership traps. Moses mentions them. There's the first, favoritism. Verse 16, and I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your brothers and sisters and judge fairly whether the case is between brother Israelites or between one of them and an alien. Favoritism, that's one of the great traps of leadership. The community needed leaders who were fair and free from corruption and racism so that everyone, rich or poor, resident or refugee, had equal status before the law of a God who loves justice. You see verse 17, do not show partiality in judging. Here both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of any man, for judgment belongs to God. That's the second trap a leader has to navigate, the trap of fear. Do not be afraid of any man, says the Moses. Fear of human opinion and reputation. And leaders especially need to be aware that they live, that they work, that they serve ultimately before an audience of one, God himself. God is the audience that really matters. The third trap that Moses highlights is isolation. Bring me any case too hard for you and I will hear it. Moses had accepted that he needed their help he couldn't do this alone, and they also needed to share their burdens and be accountable to him and to each other. I say again, character counts. More people crash and burn, plateau or quit over character issues than any others. General Norman Schwarzkopf, the Gulf War veteran, said 99% of leadership failures are failures of character. But what is character? A man visited a carnival fairground with his daughter one day, and she asked him if, uh, if she could buy some candy floss. And when the candy floss seller handed it to her, he said, are you sure that you can eat all that by yourself? The little girl replied, sure, because I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. That's what character is all about. How big you are on the inside. Who and what you are when only God is looking. Character is the rock solid consistency and integrity of a life which is aligned with God's heart and in whom God's values run deep. And maybe those of us who are men and married in the Lansdowne family, need to step up to the plate of leadership in our families 
and homes. And maybe those of us who have been hanging around the edges of LBC for a while need to put up our hand for greater responsibility and start pulling our weight around here a bit more. That's the first principle. If Lansdowne is going to be a community on a journey, then we need leaders who invest in others. Leaders who reproduce. Here's principle two. We need people shaped by faith. If you look at the map on the screen here, just to give you a, a fix, a context, having traveled the 100 miles from Sinai to the oasis of Kadesh Barnea, Moses repeats God's promise to them. There it is in verse 21. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The people had every reason to move on. The land was theirs for the taking. God had promised it to them. But they need more reassurance. So what happens? Well, as Lorraine read the account for us, one man from each tribe was sent to check out the land. And we're told that they went as far as the fertile valley of Eshkol. Eshkol in Hebrew means cluster. It's near Hebron. And so these spies returned holding large clusters of, of fruit, maybe of grapes. And they said, hey, it's a good land. Look, it's a good land the Lord our God is giving us. So to God's promise, I have given you this land, was added the evidence before their eyes in the clusters of grapes. Wow, it's a good land. And there, our reading this morning ended. But look what happens next in verse 26. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that shocking? In spite of all they had been promised, in spite of all that they had seen with their own eyes, they chose not to listen to God's word and to listen to their fears instead. Tragically, the negative, fear-filled opinions of ten of the spies prevail in the camp of Israel. We hear their views in verse 28. Our brothers have made us lose heart. They say, the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the giants, the Anakites, there. Of course, some of that was true. But they lost sight of the bigger, more important truth that God was with them. For when we do that with our circumstances, when we allow smaller truths to overshadow greater ones, we will lose the perspective of faith. You know, I, I don't doubt that our journey away from the Lansdowne building, as that unfolds this summer, and we start operating in unfamiliar territory, I don't doubt that we're going to have to deal with issues and uncertainties and giants in the land. It's not going to be easy. But at those points, we need to be a congregation, a people shaped by faith. We mustn't allow fears to boss us. We mustn't panic. In fact, so panicked were these people by their giant fears that they revise history and they forget its lessons. The Lord hates us they said. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. And the antidote to their fears was to remember what God had done for them and who God was to them. So Moses reminds them there in verse 29, then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. 
the Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. And in the desert, there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. But in spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way that you should go. God, says Moses, let me remind you, God was a victorious soldier. He fought for us. God was a caring father. He carried us. God was a dependable guide. He provided for us. Yet in their panic, their imagination was gripped by fear. And in their fear, they experienced a very real condition, God amnesia. Do you ever suffer from that? God amnesia. When we were getting ready to move from Cardiff to Bournemouth about 20 months ago, I went up to the attic and began the process of clearing stuff out and taking it to the skip, you know, the way you, you have to do these things. And among the, the useless suitcases and the broken beach chairs, why they were there, I don't know, the hi-fi equipment of the previous 18 years, I found an old black plastic bag. And on the outside was a large white label with the words, Peter's Memories. And inside was the most unusual collection of ragged newspaper cuttings, old photographs, and ancient items. To any, any other eyes but mine, this memorabilia would have seemed rather peculiar. A multicolored kipper tie from the 1970s. A vinyl 45 RPM single record of the Doctor Who theme tune. I even found my dog-eared birth certificate. An old yellowing school report. A bill from Moss Bros for the hire of my wedding suit and a small leather rugby ball my father had apparently given me when I was just a week old. Funny, funny what we keep to remind us of life's chapters and seasons. But you know, I think we could do with an equivalent way to store our spiritual memories to prevent God amnesia to remind us of the journey with God when prayers were answered, when the seemingly impossible was possible, when the smallest detail was covered and the biggest dangers avoided. Some people keep a journal, some a prayer chart. We were, I think, doing a bit of that last week as a church when we spent time together in our prayer week. It was a really useful thing to climb into the attic of 2014, and some of us can go further back than that, of course, at LBC, and we found the bag labeled memories. And we encouraged each other as we prayed to remember all that God has done for us as a church over the past, all the help he's given, all the provision he's made in our lives. It's good, isn't it, to lean on the past, not to live in it, but to lean on it. For we are called to the adventure of the future. And we step confidently into that future on the basis of what we have known of God's character and faithfulness. And we mustn't let fear dictate the next steps of our journey. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. I don't know what personal fears you are facing right now. We're all, we all have some. Job insecurity, health anxieties, relationship problems. Many of them are very real and challenging. Much of what we do in life is done out of fear, not faith. How many of us are afraid of failure? How many of us fail to be decisive because we are afraid what will happen if we do? How many of us have, have become quite skilled at covering up? so that not even the people closest to us have any sense of what's going on at the level of our hearts. 
How many of us have moments of compromise fueled by the fear of man? How many of us have given particular people too much power or influence over us? How many of us let fear keep us silent when we ought to speak or drive us to speak when we ought to be silent? Fear can overwhelm your senses. It can, it can distort your thinking. It can capture your attention so that you can spend more time worrying about what others think than about what God does. Fear can cause you to forget what you know and to lose sight of who you are. It can cause you to run when you should stay and to stay when you should run. Fear can make God look small and your circumstances large. Fear can be the soil of your biggest doubts and your greatest questions. What is the answer to all that fear? The only solution I know is awe of God. The right fear of God. For only the fear of God has the spiritual power to overwhelm all the horizontal fears that can capture your heart and mind. The only way to put our fears in their proper place is by a greater fear, the fear of the Lord God. That's the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. For it's only when God looms larger than anything you are facing that you can be productive and truly free. Awe of God is really the only way to be free of the fear of what is coming next. When my trust in God is greater than the fear of the unknown, I'll be able to rest. So this morning, own your fears, confess your fears, face your fears, and take them to the cross. For there at the cross, the perfect love of God casts out fear. There at the cross, God is a victorious soldier who dies for you and rises again. There at the cross, is a caring father who bears your sin and guilt. There at the cross is a dependable guide who points you forward in resurrection hope. Let me tell you why it's important to operate by faith and not fear. It's the difference between spiritual victory and defeat, between enjoying the blessing of God and missing out on it. That was the tragic consequence of, for Israel in the wilderness. And it gives us our final and short last principle. Lessons learned in defeat. Listen to verse 34. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, not a man of this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your forefathers. God's patience finally runs out. A door of opportunity closes on this group of people, never to open again. They'd lack the faith to seize God's moment, and they would spend years regretting it. And there was no excuse for their failure to believe and trust God. The lessons of the past should have taught them. The promises of the future should have inspired them. So their refusal to move on is a deep offense to God. And an entire adult generation, with the exception of the two spies, Caleb and Joshua, an entire adult generation listened to their fears rather than the promises of God's word. And they wandered for 40 years and died in the wilderness, never entering the promised land. Do you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder what people might have accomplished for God in their lives if only they had not listened to the skeptics, the doubters, the moaners. We can sometimes pay a very heavy price for disobedience and lack of faith in God. A spiritual misjudgment, a poor choice, an act of fear, not faith, can rob us in minutes what we might have enjoyed for years. And a whole family, no, a whole generation can be impacted by the consequences of that. Nobody is immune. Even Moses, the great leader himself, gets caught up in the aftershock of Israel's rebellion and unbelief. Verse 37, because of you, the Lord became angry with me also. 
and said, you shall not enter the land either. Now, you would have thought that the people of Israel would have got the message, but they don't. They appear incapable of learning the lesson. So from verse 41, they take matters into their own hands. Then you replied, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it easy to go up into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up and fight, because I will not be with you. You'll be defeated by your enemies. Do you see the great irony there? When God tells them to go up, they don't. When God tells them not to go up, they do. How perverse is human nature at times. They didn't want to enter the promised land, but they couldn't keep away from the forbidden land. God was preparing that land for a faithful, believing generation. And until that generation had grown up in the wilderness, the people of God would not be ready to claim the promise of God. And so with that haunting phrase, I will not be with you, this particular episode closes. That is the new reality which the tribes had brought upon themselves, but which they hadn't adjusted to. So when they go out to fight in their own strength and without the promise of God's presence, guess what happens? They're defeated. What has changed? It's the same army. One big difference. God was not with them in the same way he had been. And that change makes all the difference in the world. In fact, that's the only difference that matters. Is God with us or not? My friends, there are battles that we can try to fight, challenges we can try to respond to, issues we can try to resolve, but they may not be the ones God is interested in us winning. God has moved on, and we haven't. And so we end up fighting yesterday's battles in our own strength. There is nothing worse than spending your energy in life on stuff that doesn't have the blessing of God, the presence of God, or the ear of God. And so before we move forward as a church family and take action as a community, we need to keep praying and asking God to be with us, to fight for us, to guide us. And the great, great assurance of the gospel is this, that in Jesus, God is with us and for us that his Holy Spirit is in us and that he has promised to build his church here and throughout the world. That's God's vision. His picture of the future which produces passion. See, I have given you this land. 